Well, hello and a very warm welcome to this Scope Ratings webinar, which we've entitled Italian Non-Performing Lease ABS Markets on a Promising Course. My name is Keith Mullen, and it's my absolute pleasure to be your moderator for today's session. I'm absolutely delighted also to be joined today by Rosella Guidoni and Paolo Lichtenstein from Scope's Structured Finance Team. Um, in a moment, Rosella and Paolo will take you through a presentation and after that, we'll be very happy to take your questions. Now, there is a questions um, function on the platform here. So as Rosella and Paolo are talking, please feel free to type in your questions and we'll do our best to answer them at the end. Now, as Paolo and Rosella will explain, um, Scope expects up to a billion euros of non-performing Italian lease ABS over the next year. But as I'll explain, this emerging asset class does have some unique complexities and challenges. And please also note that we have actually produced a research report on this subject, and we will make this available to you at the earliest opportunity, which will be either later today or at worst tomorrow morning. So that's it from me. So without further ado, I'm absolutely delighted to hand the floor to you, Rosella, who I believe uh, you're going to kick us off. So good to see you and um, over to you. Thank you very much, Keith, for the introduction and the presentation. Um, so as Keith already uh, introduced, actually, today's webinar is going to vert uh, on the three key main challenges that we foresee for the non-performing these uh, asset class. Actually, even though um, the market conditions and the legal framework um, developments have facilitated the issuance uh, of non-performing lease securitization, so we still see these three challenges for the asset class that, however, we think that um, will be overcome uh, by the market in a more mature uh, phase. Mm, the first challenge regards the uh, timing of recoveries. Uh, because for non-performing lease, uh, mm, the total recovery timing is uh, uh, volatile and uncertain, as it depends uh, um, highly on the length uh, of the repossession phase, uh, the regularization phase, uh, and the sale phase uh, for the leased assets. Uh, these three phases uh, ultimately lead uh, to the sale uh, in the open market of the leased assets, but all of them are a prerequisite uh, uh, for the service recovery strategy. Um, for example, um, in case of complex uh, and illiquid assets, if uh, um, some real estate anomalies are found, uh, the total recovery timing uh, uh, increases. Uh, the same happens if, for example, there are some uh, uh, constraints uh, with uh, some municipalities uh, or some environmental uh, issues. Uh, all these uh, uh, kind of situations and uh, uh, findings uh, can contribute uh, to make the total recovery timing uh, um, volatile and uh, um, uncertain. Um, we will uh, talk later on into more details about uh, this first challenge. Um, the second one regards the um, recovery costs because uh, uh, the least recovery costs uh, are material and uh, um, volatile. They are actually, let's say, higher uh, than the NPI costs and uh, um, of a different nature because most uh, of the um, recovery lease uh, uh, costs uh, have a recurrent nature, so they are also a function of the time, and most of them are uh, related to the property management activity that is conducted by the servicer in relation to the to the lease the property while um, in case of non-performing loans most of the uh, recovery costs uh, have a legal nature um, and are one of uh, uh, legal costs the risk here of having uh, um, let's say high and volatile costs is that um, if the servicer underestimate uh, the amount of the cost in the business plan uh, there's the risk uh, that the transaction register uh, lower than expected net cash flows uh, that are ultimately reflected by the cumulative collection ratios of the transaction. And these uh, uh, might trigger some structural uh, events uh, like the underperformance and subordination events uh, that ultimately alter the priority of payments uh, for the note holders. 
Um, the third, the key challenge that we see for the asset class is related to the presence uh, of a modest number of specialized services. Uh, basically, in contrast with the MPS, where we think that the servicer market is uh, um, mature, um, for this specific asset class, uh, um, we see only a limited number of servicers uh, and uh, the real estate capabilities, uh, especially for the lease, uh, are key to ensure a smooth sale uh, of the asset. Uh, why, while, let's say, they are less relevant uh, um, for the servicer strategy in case of uh, um, MPLs. Uh, um, in contrast, we know that uh, in other jurisdictions, uh, uh, such as Spain and Portugal, uh, where the reposition strategy is common, there is a higher um, amount of uh, a higher number of specialized servicers. Um, as Keith already mentioned at the beginning, uh, despite these three um, challenges for this nascent asset class, in any case, we expect by end of next year, 2022, uh, up to 1 billion of non-performing uh, Italian lease uh, securitization. Um, this will be partially driven by the defaults uh, following the expiry of the payment holidays, so the moratoria uh, ending in December 2021. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rosella. Um, okay, so let's discuss a bit more in detail the first uh, factor that was mentioned by Rosella, uh, namely the timing of recoveries. Overall, recovery timing is generally shorter than for non-performing loans. As legal proceedings are usually shorter, the asset already been owned by the originator or in the context of the securitization by the LISCO. But accurately assessing the timing for repossession, regularization and marketing is key to forecasting the timing of collections. According to Asilea data, the average time to repossess and regularize real estate assets ranges from 19 to 34 months, and the average time to sell repossess assets ranges from 20 to 34 months. As expected, I would say industrial assets take, you see that take longer compared to other asset types, especially on the time to sell, while total timing from repossession to sell for offices, for instance, is the shortest. There are several factors that may contribute to the delay in the repossession and regularization phases. For instance, during the repossession phase, removal of movable assets from lease properties being more difficult than the service initially expected. For instance, heavy or large machinery and equipment inside real industrial assets, or if the asset is occupied by a third party other than the lessee, uh, in which case an agreement needs to be reached with the sub -lessee. Once a list asset is repossessed, the regularization phase begins. A common practice, however, to shorten the overall recovery timing is to overlap the repossession and the regularization phases. During the regularization phase, the cadastral urbanization and environmental activities are performed. Delays in this phase usually occur if available documentation, for instance, is incomplete or if unexpected issues emerge. For example, they need to restore structural changes performed by the lessee to the asset without authorization, environmental cleanup of land or industrial sites, coordination of all the source in case of syndicated leases or compliance with municipal projects linked to the asset lease, as Rosella was mentioning before. But what happens if the assets are not repossessed on time? Well, in that case, the properties cannot be transferred to the LISCO. So far, the market has overcome the challenging by adopting different solutions, such as the leases being excluded from the portfolio perimeter. This is the most obvious one, a partial demerger where the assets are assigned to the LISCO, global clauses during, um, ruling that if the assets are not repossessed and regularized uh, by a certain date, then they are repurchased by the seller, uh, or a ramp up or a warehousing period 
during which the servicer has to repossess and regularize the leased asset before assigning them to the lease code. So once the repossession and regularization phases are completed and the assets are transferred to the lease code, the asset is ready to be marketed. The time it takes to sell a repossessed leased asset depends on the asset type, the location, the market liquidity, and to some extent, it is also a function of the services real estate expertise. If the services real estate capabilities are limited, or if the servicer expertise is not extensive for certain asset types, the sale phase may take longer than average. For example, a servicer specialized in the sale of commercial assets may find it harder to sell industrial assets, which have different sales channels and buyers. Due diligence is key for a correct assessment of the timing for each recovery phase. It typically consists of different uh, let's say, different phases, the technical analysis to estimate the least assets associated cost, the legal analysis with the aim of identifying potential risk in relation to the assets transferability, any missing documentation, or the presence of syndicated leases, as we were mentioning before, that may cause delays in the, in, in, in the recovery timing. Appraisal updates, this is quite important, uh, to uh, where valuations are updated to accurately estimate the asset sale price. A positive feature is that leased assets may, re may be reappraised with full valuations after repossession. And finally, roll up sessions, which are mainly dedicated to estimate assets exit price and the time to sell. Um. So um, Paula already, uh, let's say, explored in details the first challenge that we mentioned in the beginning uh, regarding the uh, total recovery timing and, let's say, the risk of experiencing some delays in that. Um, the second challenge that instead I mentioned in the beginning is related to the materiality um, of the recovery expenses uh, and uh, um, their volatility for the lease asset class. Uh, now, uh, the risk uh, in this specific case uh, is that uh, um, the actual uh, um, lease expenses uh, deviate from the original servicer estimate in the business plan. As I already uh, mentioned previously, uh, this translates uh, potentially in lower than expected uh, net cash flows uh, for the transactions that might trigger via the cumulative collection ratio uh, these uh, structural underperformance and subordination events that ultimately would accelerate uh, uh, the senior not older principal payment. So the estimate uh, of the recovery expenses is particularly relevant for this asset class. Uh, um, now, the real question is why uh, um, the recovery expenses for lease uh, are so high and uh, um, uncertain. Um, let's first uh, clarify one point. Uh, uh, first, uh, mm, lease costs are material because um, they weight between 13 and 15% uh, of uh, um, gross proceeds. Uh, uh, most of them are real estate property management costs, uh, um, while the legal costs uh, are um, in a limited share. Um, so let's say that uh, on average, 92% uh, of the total costs relate to the real estate recovery expenses, um, while just 8% relate to the, to the legal cost. Uh, so we can argue that um, lease expenses in Italy um, are also comparable with other jurisdictions, uh, such as Spain, Portugal and Cyprus, uh, where in any case, the repossession is uh, um, the core strategy. Um, the fact that uh, most of the recovery expenses for lease of a recurrent nature means uh, that instead of being one-off costs, uh, they uh, depend on the time to sell uh, the leased asset. And this ultimately means that if, uh, for several reasons, there is a delay um, in the sale process of the asset, this can significantly increase uh, the amount uh, of the, um, let's say, uh, lease uh, real estate cost, uh, ultimately eroding uh, uh, the note holder's final proceeds. Uh, 
Uh, clearly, as also Paola mentioned previously, costs uh, are also a function of the service as a sales strategy. Um, what is interesting to uh, notice here is that if the servicer uh, uh, changes uh, the sales strategy for the asset uh, um, and incurs into additional cost to make it more attractive uh, for the investors, like for example, CapEx, uh, um, if uh, still, uh, uh, despite having sustained this uh, um, additional cost, the, the sale of the asset delays, uh, then the additional costs that are sustained by the servicer might in any case offset uh, any higher recoveries that might come uh, from the uh, from the first strategy so not always uh, um, not always uh, the change in the sales strategy is uh, beneficial uh, uh, from a credit perspective it clearly depends uh, on um, how capable is the servicer in uh, uh, managing the asset meanwhile uh, and uh, in uh, carrying on uh, uh, a successful uh, uh, sales strategy for the asset. In this chart, uh, um, in this table, uh, we present an example of, uh, um, let's say, the main uh, type of cost uh, in relation to the lease uh, uh, asset class, um, their frequency, and their presence for the non-performing lease securitizations versus the uh, MPL securitizations. We also present the weight that they have on the total business plan cost. Um, so basically what you can easily see from this table is that uh, first, uh, as I mentioned previously, most of the uh, lease costs uh, are recurrent, so have an ongoing uh, uh, nature, um, especially in case of leases, uh, um, the costs that weigh more uh, on the total uh, uh, costs are the taxes, like the IMU for the asset, and then the, uh, let's say, OPEX and management uh, costs. Um, these are, let's say, typically the, the most uh, uh, material type of costs for the lease asset class. Um, for MPLs, uh, uh, instead, as you see, most of the costs relate to the legal uh, expenses. Uh, and uh, the materiality also uh, of the lease cost uh, is reflected by the fact that, uh, as I mentioned previously, on average, um, lease costs represent between 13 and 15 percent of the gross proceeds, uh, um, while in case of MPLs, uh, they weight between 7 and uh, 9 percent. Uh, uh, of the gross proceeds. So clearly they are, let's say, more relevant uh, in contrast with the uh, um, MPLs. Another point uh, um, that needs to be highlighted um, is that by law, uh, servicers can recover part of the sustained cost in relation to the management of the leased asset as rebeatable expenses. Um, so eventually, if the asset is uh, sold uh, at a good price, uh, then uh, the servicer can also recover part uh, of the rebeatable expenses. Um, however, there is always a caveat to this consideration. Uh, um, still, by law, if the lease property is uh, sold uh, at a higher price than the gross book value, considering any, uh, let's say, um, potential rebeatable expenses, then the extra proceeds uh, shall return to the lessee. Uh, in other words, uh, there is no upside uh, for the LISCO, but still the servicer has the possibility to partially recover um, the expenses that have a repeatable um, nature. Um, now, the third challenge that uh, we mentioned at the beginning is related to the fact that basically the servicers for the lease asset class um, are um, in a modest number and have a limited track record. Um, in contrast, uh, um, the services market for MPLs um, is mature. And that's why to better position themselves as lease servicers, uh, some of the MPL servicers are entering into real estate partnerships uh, to grow their uh, skills and expertise uh, also in this specific uh, uh, in this specific area of the real estate management. Uh, actually, this is also a similar strategy to what uh, um, has been pursued by the Rioco uh, services uh, that still uh, are required to have uh, uh, stronger real estate skills to manage the repossessed assets. Um, 
clearly, uh, since the leased uh, assets uh, are to be sold in the open market, uh, the servicer uh, should be able to preserve the assets value via property management skills uh, to improve market appetite, uh, but also to uh, remarket uh, the asset and prepare them uh, for the sale. Um, another important thing that I want to mention is that uh, now we are talking, let's say, in general about uh, uh, lease, the lease asset class, uh, but clearly we have to distinguish between the real estate uh, lease asset class uh, and the lease machinery and uh, uh, equipment asset class, because the uh, skills that are required uh, by the services are different. Namely, that uh, let's say leased machinery and equipment are subject to the uh, obsolescence risk that drives their depreciation. Um, this ultimately means that they require quick sales because otherwise uh, they will depreciate uh, um, faster um, and they require ad hoc channels. Uh, uh, in order to reach uh, specialized buyers. Um, in contrast, uh, um, real estate leased assets like the industrial, the commercial leased assets are less impacted by the obsolescence risk, uh, but clearly they require uh, strong real estate uh, and marketing skills uh, um, to, preserve the, to preserve their value and be sold in the open market. This is important to be highlighted because it means that um, a servicer that is, that is specialized in the management and sale of real estate leased assets um, is not necessarily expert about the management and sale of the leased machinery and the equipment assets. Um, Real estate expertise is also key uh, in other jurisdictions, uh, such as Spain, Portugal, and uh, Cyprus, uh, where um, similarly the assets are typically repossessed and then sold uh, in the open market. In other countries, we know, uh, like France and Greece, uh, that borrowers typically undergo the amicable solutions or restructuring plans. So let's say that the situation uh, in those jurisdictions is quite different than uh, uh, the Italian one regarding the lease asset class. This table highlights the key differences between MPLs with and without a vehicle structure and non-performing leasing transactions. For secured assets, in MPL transactions with no real constructor, assets are not repossessed and they are sold via a judicial auction. Whereas in non-performing leasing transactions, all assets are repossessed and then sold in the, in the open market that Rosella was explaining before. For MPL transactions with a real constructor, only a selected um, number of assets are acquired by the Ryoko and then repossessed and sold in the, in the open market. The recovery timing in MPL transactions is relatively long with an average wall of seven years. The timing mainly depends on the asset type, sorry, on the, legal, uh, on the, on the type of legal proceedings and the court assigned. Whereas for non-performing leases, the average wall is shorter around five years and it's more related to the services skills and the real estate market conditions. For MPLs with a RIOCO, the timing also partly depends on the services skills and market conditions for the repossessed assets. As regards recovery expenses, as Rosella Waits was explaining before, they are in the range of 7 to 9% of gross proceeds for MPLs, being mainly related to legal costs, whereas recovery expenses in leasing transactions are in the range of 13 to 15% of gross proceeds and mainly linked to real estate costs such as maintenance and management costs, taxes, etc. Again, the situation is mixed for NPLs with Rioja, with higher costs related to their receivables with repossessed assets. A structural difference in the SPVs involved in the transactions uh, is that for MPLs with no RIOCO, there's only one issuer acquiring the receivables. For non-performing leasing, there's the issuer acquiring the leasing contracts and issuing the notes, and the lease co acquiring the real estate assets, 
the proceeds from the sale of the assets then flows to the SPB becoming part of available funds to repay the notes. And finally, NPS transactions with a real constructor, there's an issuer acquiring the receivables and issuing the notes, the Ryoko acquiring a selected number of assets to preserve their value, generally at auction, and then the proceeds of the sale of the assets also flow to the SPB to become available funds. However, in some of these structures, some of the uh, funds may be leaked as incentive fees for the Ryoko servicer or also partially if the assets are sold at a premium compared to the business plan, they may be leaked and not flow into the structure. Here we provide, uh, just to conclude the, the presentation, a snapshot on the non-performing lease market. Um, so as you can see from the chart um, on the right, uh, um, uh, as of December 2020, um, the stock of the non-performing lease exposures um, amounted more or less at 11 billion. Uh, while in 2015, uh, the amount was around uh, 27 uh, billion. So clearly this means that uh, uh, in the last five years, uh, uh, there has been um, a material deleverage uh, regarding the stock. Basically, 2020 volumes were 57% lower than 2015 volumes. And uh, um, the material deleverage was uh, partially explained uh, mostly by direct sales uh, of the non-performing lease portfolio, uh, plus uh, uh, from the issuance of some uh, um, securitizations uh, on the non-performing lease portfolio. Um, clearly, um, as we mentioned uh, during the webinar, the non-performing lease market is quite different uh, versus the uh, NPL market, even though the two asset classes uh, have some similarities. Um, but in terms, uh, let's say, of um, securitizations, uh, basically, um, the only uh, the non-performing lease market just uh, saw two uh, public securitizations uh, uh, in 2020. Uh, Titan SPV and uh, uh, Relay SPV uh, for a total amount of uh, 1.9 billion uh, in terms of GBV, uh, both GAX eligible. Um, and the two portfolios uh, um, were uh, composed of a mix between um, real estate leases, exposures, and machinery and equipment, even though most of the portfolios were composed by real estate uh, uh, lease exposures. In any case, the important point is that prior to 2020, um, there was no public uh, uh, securitization with uh, these uh, uh, um, with the non-performing lease uh, uh, asset class. Um, in contrast, we know that the NPL market is definitely more mature. Uh, in 2020, it saw uh, 16 billion in terms of GBV of securitizations, uh, so 10 transactions, and all of them were GAX eligible. But even prior, um, uh, a material number of securitizations were issued because uh, uh, since 2017, uh, uh, more or less 93 billion of uh, uh, GBV of securitizations were issued uh, for a total number of 40 securitizations. So with this, uh, we, we concluded the, the presentation. So let's see if we have some questions then. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Rosella and Paola, for that very detailed and very insightful presentation. Um, and so uh, please, as Rosella said, please do type in questions as uh, you have them, um, and we'll try and answer them in the, in the time that we've got left. Um, actually, let me, there is one I've got here, um, which I think is a, a kind of nice segue from uh, the, uh, the the last um, comments. And perhaps... Um, uh, Rosella, maybe I can put this one to you, which is um, you mentioned Titan and Relay. How are these two transactions actually performing 
since I think you rated them, they were rated like a bit one year ago, uh, more or less. Yeah. Um, so thanks for the thanks for the question. Um, it's clearly a relevant one because, as I mentioned previously, um, uh, the market has seen only uh, two public securitizations so far, uh, Titan and uh, um, Relay. Actually, the point here is that uh, uh, both uh, uh, securitizations closed uh, in December 2020 and uh, um, they basically pay on a semi-annual basis. So this means that um, as of today, both transactions, both securitizations uh, um, have only one uh, interest payment date. And uh, mm, the point here is that uh, uh, one interest payment date, we think that, uh, you know, it's not enough um, to assess the performance of a securitization. And that's also why we typically exclude uh, um, those securitizations from our semi-annual um, MPL report, because uh, um, typically in the very first interest payment dates, uh, um, the cumulative collection ratio uh, of the securitizations are um, high, uh, and this is due to the effect uh, of uh, uh, both the ad interim collections, uh, so those collections accrued from the uh, portfolio's cutoffs uh, until the transfer date, uh, and uh, um, what in the MPL world uh, uh, we call cash in court proceeds, uh, and what in the lease world uh, we call, uh, let's say, preliminary sales proceeds. So the proceeds are coming from some preliminary uh, sales agreement. Um, these factors contribute to uh, to have a very good CCRs in the first inter interest payment date. Um, so mm, let's say to conclude the, the reasoning here, the point is that in reality, both the transactions, Titan and Relay, um, registered uh, good CCRs, uh, so good cumulative collection ratios above 100% in the first IPD uh, in the range uh, of 130-134%, but as I said, it's uh, premature, uh, uh, so it's too early now to, to assess their performance uh, uh, based on just one IPD. We would need at least, uh, I think, three uh, uh, IPDs. Uh, uh, just to to be able to analyze uh, uh, better their performance. Yeah, no, absolutely, it makes sense. Um, there are some questions coming in, uh, Paola. Perhaps I could alert you to that. There's a question about um, costs and the repossession timing. Do you want to take a look and perhaps uh, maybe read the question out and, and provide some feedback? Yes, of course. The question is, are there extra costs linked to the repossession and that could be incurred if the repossession timing increases? Uh, well, it depends, uh, let's say, it depends mainly on, first, on the, the, the structure that uh, is decided. Because if the repossession activity is performed before the securitization, uh, so that uh, assets are already repossessed and regularized before being securitized, then these costs are usually incurred by the originator, it's not structural cost paid by the issuer. Uh, and the timing, the impact on the timing would be the, like, the timing of the securitization where it's launched. Uh, if in case they are, let's say these activities are happening after closing uh, for at least for a portion of the assets, then uh, this could actually increase the timing for recoveries. This is what uh, we were mentioning uh, before, uh, absolutely yes. And also depending again of the structure uh, that was selected, it may also mean that uh, um, the asset may be out of the securitization, so it would could be excluded. Um, regarding cost, um, it, it depends on what exactly is, is going on. If, for instance, if the, there's a, a sub C that is occupying the, 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 the property uh, and, and that, the, let's say, the uh, longer timing is due to negotiations, maybe it does not impact necessarily cost. Um, um, it, in, in any case, if uh, again, if it's the issuer paying uh, this cost, 
the longer the asset is sitting in the uh, issuer uh, or in the lease co, um, 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 then clearly you have maintenance costs uh, and taxes that uh, clearly you may need to, to, to cover as well. Um, so the answer is, is yes, uh, but it could vary a lot depending on exactly the, the details. No, indeed, absolutely. Um, and Rosella, there's a question that come in um, and it relates to one of the challenges that was highlighted uh, during the presentation, which is how do you rate the quality of the real estate service providers involved? Yeah, um, so thanks for the question. I think it's a, it's a very interesting one. Um, so basically, um, as we also say in uh, our general um, MPL methodology, uh, where we uh, talk about the uh, servicers in general, um, we always, let's say, take into consideration uh, um, which is uh, the uh, entity that is providing uh, either the servicing activities or uh, specifically in this case, uh, the real estate uh, activities. Um, this is something that we typically assess uh, uh, with our um, operational, uh, um, uh, let's say, operational uh, assessments, uh, uh, where we basically uh, ask uh, the real estate providers some questions uh, and uh, we let them explain to us uh, uh, which is their track record and their experience. So clearly, um, let's say what is important from our perspective is to understand uh, which is the experience uh, of the real estate provider in terms of, uh, you know, number of years, uh, um, amount uh, of assets uh, under management uh, in the asset class, but also which are, let's say, the typical channels that uh, uh, the real estate provider um, has uh, uh, that can be leveraged uh, uh, for the sale of the asset. Uh, and also if, uh, uh, let's say, the real estate provider has some uh, uh, particular partnership with other operators in the market that might strengthen uh, its positioning uh, uh, or not. So clearly, let's say, during our uh, operational reviews, uh, we take into consideration um, a lot of uh, variables uh, that helps us to let's say, qualitatively uh, assess uh, um, how good is the real estate provider uh, in his job. But clearly, as we explained also during the webinar, um, it is particularly relevant uh, for the lease asset class, uh, how good uh, is the servicer or the real estate provider in, uh, in terms of real estate skills, uh, because the sale uh, occurs in the open market. So if the servicer is not capable enough or not expert enough uh, to ensure a smooth sale of the asset there's uh, uh, let's say a material risk uh, uh, for the securitizations because uh, it's likely that the amount of the costs uh, uh, will increase uh, and as we explained before um, the not holders priority uh, might be altered so it's really key uh, for the lease asset class the role assumed by the real estate providers no, absolutely. Um, indeed. Um, uh, Paola, perhaps I can come to you for this next question, uh, which is this. Is there a difference between the collateral backing non-forming lease versus NPL transactions? Well, yes. First, the, there's a structural difference that uh, we were highlighting during the presentation uh, is the ownership of the collateral. In non-performing lease securitizations, the originator sells the leasing contract and the leased asset to the issuer uh, or, or, uh, and the leasing, the lease code respectively. And the lease code sells the asset in the open market and transfer the sale process to the issuer. Whereas in NPL securitization, the originator sells the loans and any credit rights arising from them to the SPB, but mortgage properties remain under the borrower's ownership until they are sold uh, at the judicial sale. Um, in terms of portfolio compositions, yes, they have differed so far as well. NPL securitization have been so far backed by a material share of residential assets well, the real estate collateral by nature uh, 
are uh, industrial and commercial assets for the leasing. So this is also something that uh, um, we, we have uh, taken into consideration when we analyze the, the both trans type of transaction. Indeed, okay, um, thanks. And I've got one more, perhaps I can go back to you, uh, if I may, Rosella, which is going, going back to the Relay and Titan uh, transactions. Um, did they show a similar portfolio composition since they're both rated triple B for the class A. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for the question. Um, that is an interesting one, actually. Um, so I would say there's not really a straightforward answer in a way, because uh, um, I mean, despite the rating that uh, uh, was assigned to the senior notes, um, for certain, let's say, um, high level aspects, we can argue that. Uh, um, the portfolios were similar in Relay and Titan um, because, for example, um, most of the leases were related to uh, corporate borrowers, as it is also actually natural for the lease asset class. Um, and mainly, as I mentioned also previously, most of the leases were uh, real estate leases rather than machinery and equipment that were only in a smaller share uh, in the portfolio. Uh, so let's say from a high level perspective, yes, they were similar, uh, but then technically speaking, uh, they got some material differences that were ultimately reflected, uh, especially from the timing perspective. Uh, because, uh, um, for example, um, Relay uh, portfolio um, had a lower share of repossessed and uh, regularized assets versus uh, uh, Titan portfolio. So I think that um, it was something around 24% uh, for Relay versus uh, 50, basically 60% for Titan. Um, this at closing. Uh, um, so this basically um, explained a higher weighted average life uh, uh, for Relay uh, securitizations versus uh, uh, Titan. In uh, Relay, I think it was around 5.5 uh, uh, years uh, uh, while in Titan, it was uh, around 4.5 years. Um, then regarding instead the uh, portfolio composition in terms of uh, uh, type of real estate uh, uh, lease, um, industrial leases weighted about half um, of the total asset value for Titan portfolio. Um, while in Relay, uh, most of the asset value was related to commercial uh, uh, real estate leases that uh, weighted around 56% uh, uh, of the portfolio. Um, then residential and uh, land leases weighted uh, uh, less, uh, but this comes also in a natural way from the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, lease uh, uh, asset class. Another difference um, was related to the type of valuation because uh, uh, in Titan, there was a higher share of uh, full uh, and uh, drive-by valuations, uh, while in Relay, um, there was, a, let's say, a smaller share. Um, I think just to, to give you an idea that in Titan, uh, we're talking about 70-80% of the valuations that were performed via full or drive-by uh, techniques, uh, while in Relay, it was around 30%. Uh, 30 um, so let's say, um, as I explained, both in terms of uh, uh, um, stage uh, in the repossession and regularization phase and in terms of uh, uh, real estate lease composition and type of valuation, uh, the two transactions uh, uh, differed. Um, overall, uh, um, let's say the net effect uh, of a different composition uh, um, was in any case not that high because the final uh, recovery rate uh, um, that we saw for both transactions were very similar in a range between uh, uh, 40 and 45 percent, uh, basically, of the GBV. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I have no more questions at uh, this stage. So, um, Paola and Rosella, unless you have anything more to add, uh, perhaps we could close the session. Um,
So uh, let me, before we do close, thank you both very much to you, Paolo and Rosella, for your uh, very insightful comments um, on this emerging asset class. Um, and thank you to you for uh, tuning in and watching. I hope you found that uh, interesting and helpful and insightful. Um, uh, Scope Ratings is doing a lot of these sessions now as a function of its uh, outreach to the market. Um, and so we do have the regular sessions and we, we will be back hopefully soon with another Structure Finance uh, webinar. Um, but in the meantime, um, thank you again for, for watching and we wish you a very a successful rest of day and we'll see you soon again okay, goodbye for now thank you very much thank you very much have a good day bye bye